everyone, uh, is this on? Oh, okay, okay. So I have to both yell and... Uh... <laughs> Here, let me try something. You want... Wait. Uh... This is my... oh. oh, okay. Now, I, I, I think it works soon. All right, everyone, uh, let's get started. So, this is just for Zoom. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, this one's on Zoom. Oh, okay. But watch here. Okay, now go. Okay, awesome. So, uh, Sorry for that. Uh, it's a great pleasure to host Graham Smith uh, at iQuist. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Graham. So he got his PhD uh, at Caltech in 2006 with John Preskill. Uh, and then after a very short stint at the University of Bristol, joined IBM Research, first as a postdoc and then as a research scientist. Uh, stayed there until 2016 and then academia called him back and he went to University of Colorado Boulder where I was very fortunate to be a postdoc with him. Uh, and he re recently received tenure from University of Colorado Boulder. And starting from this fall, he will return to his homeland, Canada, uh, to work at the University of Waterloo at the Institute for Quantum Computing. And Graham is very well known for fundamental contributions to quantum Shannon theory, and he will tell us some of them today. Uh, just let me get this on. Okay. Not to mention, one of my hobbies is on Twitter. And then if you go to at quantum underscore gram, you can follow me, where I've recently been told I'm a little bit cynical. Um, by my advisor. Um, okay, so uh, what I want to tell you about today, though, is uh, not a, a cynical story, but it's an exciting story about the theory of quantum information and maybe a little more jargony, um, Shannon theory, quantum Shannon theory. It's, you know, studying, uh, well, the quantum version of information theory. Oh, and as Felix said, let's see if we can go. Like this. Oh, yeah, I'm moving to uh, uh, IQC for geographical reasons. It's the first time someone moved from Boulder to Waterloo for geographical reasons. Um, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so, information theory, who took an information theory class before? You did. Wow, that's a lot. Not me. I. Uh, I, I taught them before, but never took one because it's not a normal physics thing to take. Uh, at least it wasn't uh, in the 90s. Um, but uh, what is information theory? It's about sending and processing data uh, using generally noisy resources and, uh, and uh, 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 you know, trying to get the best you can out of, out of, out of a noisy resource. So, for example, many of you might have thought about a, a, a bipartite state, extracting entanglement from it distilling entanglement. Many of you may have cell phones that use communication networks or, or uh, have just thought about error correcting codes. And the, the, the goal of, uh, of information uh, theory really is, is to understand what are the best rates we can achieve in scenarios where we're trying to send information from one place to another. And then uh, the sort of more specific topic, actually, no, the more general topic, yeah. Of, of quantum information theory encompasses classical information theory, but many other great questions too. Um, and the general philosophy is somewhat different from, from um, maybe a standard physics approach. We, we, what we want to do is we want to abstract away as much detail as we can uh, and find out what are the fundamental limits that nature is going to put on, um, on an information processing system. We don't usually care so much about what are the details of of, uh, of the system, what we want to understand is if we could do the best possible uh, communication strategy, let's say, uh, how will it perform? Um, and the details that we really can't do without, those are the things that uh, 
how's the mic going? It feels like it's doing something funny. It's okay. Okay. Those are the things that, uh, that give us kind of a clearer picture of, of like, what's the essential question that we're asking as we think about uh, sending quantum information around or processing it. Um, and actually the details that are left, they give us a clearer picture of quantum mechanics. Maybe they give us the sort of the most fundamental uh, physics left in quantum mechanics. And that can help us go back and understand more traditional areas of physics. Uh, and uh, well, uh, the third topic, yeah, uh, some of the strategies that we develop as we try to understand uh, sending quantum information around at a sort of abstract level, uh, they, uh, they might be useful. Uh, we might be able to approach fundamental limits or, or realize the protocols we come up with either today or more likely in the future. Um, and as, a, as an area, it's sort of very interdisciplinary. It's more about, it's, it's got some physics in it, but also there's a lot of geometry, computer science, engineering. And the main difference between classical and quantum information theory, I think, is that in the quantum setting, there are a lot more uh, different sorts of resources that come up. And um, there are much more interesting interactions of those resources. And I want to tell you uh, some stories about uh, those resources and how they interact uh, in, the, uh, in, in the talk. As, uh, ah, so what are the basic questions? We want to understand what are the resources in the theory? How can we convert them into each other? And how do they interact? And what's, what's the recipe for generating that interaction? Did anyone ever bake bread before? Yeah, so, so I got the recipe right here on the, on the front cover of this book. Uh, but you need a little more before you start baking your bread, right? You need to know what's the way that you combine the flour, salt, water, and yeast. Um, actually, this is a pretty good, uh, this is a good book, by the way, just as an aside, uh, Ken Forkish was, uh, was, uh, was an IBMer, just like me. And then he went off and instead decided to make a bakery. So it's worth, it's well worth looking. Um, uh, anyway, he learned that actually it's super stressful to run a bakery too. Uh, uh, but, uh, here's another recipe that many of you might be familiar with. It's teleportation. It's a very careful way of combining entanglement. And Alice and Bob here. And if they do it in just the right way, Alice and Bob can turn entanglement and the ability to send classical information from Alice to Bob uh, to send a, uh, a, a, a quantum state from, uh, from uh, Alice's lab up over to Bob's lab. Uh, even though you know, the classical information they send is not sufficient to send the quantum uh, the quantum state, and neither is entanglement sufficient to send anything. Somehow you put those two things together in just the right way, and you um, and you uh, uh, you can you can do your quantum transmission. So that's an example of what kind of recipes can we find, uh, and and it's also an example of two very different resources interacting in a, uh, in a useful and and I think very beautiful way. No, I feel like I skipped something. Very good. So let's, let's just do, I'm going to give you a very basic introduction to information theory, and then we're going to just look at the quantum version of uh, the basic questions of information theory. And we'll look at a few sort of special examples of, of, uh, of uh, interactions uh, between different quantum resources. If we have time, I'll just have a, a, little, uh, a little aside about, uh, about uh, um, magnetic field sensing that I just wanted to tell you about because it's, it's been on my mind recently. But if we have to, we'll, uh, we'll cut this out. Nobody, nobody needs lunch. Um, it's an hour and a half or? Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the basic quantity in, in, uh, in information theory sort of a fundamental quantity is called the capacity of a, of a channel. So the basic idea is I have some message M, I want to use some noisy channel N to send a message over to the receiver in such a way that basically they get the right message every time. With some small probability, we can accept a failure, but uh, generally we want to you know, be able to infer what the intended message was correctly. Um, and we want to send lots and lots of bits. So uh, the capacity, Oh, so, so, so how do we measure the performance of a code like this? It's in terms of its rate. How many bits do we send per use of the channel? And the capacity of the channel is just the best rate that you can get as long as you ensure that the, the errors are going to go to zero 
as the block length of the channel goes to infinity. So that's like a nice um, operational definition of what this capacity is. Um, but the sort of beautiful, almost hypnotizing result of, uh, of maybe, uh, well, of, of information theory, the sort of first or second great result in information theory is that you can characterize this operational task, this, this quantity, which is defined in terms of some huge optimization over error correcting codes in terms of a very simple mathematical formula. Uh, you can just maximize the correlation that you can generate between a single use, uh, between the input and the output of a single use of the channel, um, where you measure the correlation in terms of this, this mutual information. Uh, and in fact, even the optimal, the optimal distribution that you're optimizing over, you know, you pick the optimal distribution on X, and that gives you a recipe for uh, designing uh, a code book that will achieve the capacity. Right? So this is kind of, uh, you know, a nice story where there's this problem you want to solve. It has a nice mathematical solution. And, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot more to it than that. But for us today, that's, that's, uh, that's you know, a good summary of like the first paper in information theory and one of the fundamental results. And a, a, a sort of key mathematical property of, uh, of, uh, of this classical capacity is that uh, it's additive. So that means if I evaluate the capacity of this channel together with the capacity of that channel, if I'm allowed to use the two things together, how good are they? Well, it's the value, it's the capacity of the first one plus the capacity of the second one. They, they just add up, right? And what that means is if you're trying to use these two channels optimally, uh, um, should I, does anybody need me to tell you what this wire, this thing does? We use, it's, we, we used to use these to send information, um, but somehow, I don't know, I, I didn't want to put a router in there. I wasn't sure how to make Wi-Fi. Oh, there's a Wi-Fi symbol. I'll do that next. Um, but the point is that like, it's a very simple interaction between uh, the two channels, and you just use them independently, and that's the best you can do. So this is, a, you know, to move on with the, the food uh, strategy, additive uh, uh, additive uh, interactions, like what we see in the classical capacity of a classical channel, it's kind of like making a smoothie. If you want it to taste more like pineapple, you add a little more pineapple. And this sort of, the more pineapple, the more pineapple-y it tastes, and you just mix it all together. There's no non-trivial interaction, really, unless you start adding some very strange things to your smoothie. And then, uh, whereas non-additive interactions, like what we're going to see for quantum uh, capacities and, and communication problems, is a lot like more, um, a lot more like making bread. Uh, you have to make sure you put things together in just the right way. And in that case, you can get something kind of like, it's almost, bread is almost not comparable to eating flour, right? It's, it's just a different kind of thing because uh, you've caused the interaction. Uh, you've sort of taken advantage of, of a, a deeper knowledge of what interactions you get. Can anyone spot the error over here? Error. There's walnuts. I didn't list it. And also, by the way, it has, it has cranberries too. Um, and for the experts, uh, you got to reduce the water a little bit if you're going to put the cranberries in, otherwise it'll be too, too sticky. Um, we, just, we just had a bake-off at, uh, at Jilla, actually. Uh, okay. Um, and I, did, I didn't win, but... Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. Actually, a, a, a loaf of bread is fundamentally a quantum computer. And um, if you would like to invest in my startup, I would I'd be happy to just accept whatever, whatever, uh, whatever angel investments you'd like to offer. Um, okay, so, it, so the additivity that, uh, that we were talking about, it's like super useful for us because the way you show this, this, this magic formula of the classical capacity just being equal to a single use, uh, a single letter formula, a maximization over one use of the channel, is first you show this, this sort of ugly formula. The capacity you can show is achievable by doing a random coding strategy. And then because this limit is very annoying because now we have to do an optimization over uh, inputs to an arbitrarily large number of channels, but the additivity comes to the rescue. And since the C1 quantity is additive, uh, then th we get rid of this whole limit and it's just equal to uh, the classical capacity is just equal to uh, a single uh, a single simple formula that we can go off and evaluate like on a computer. You give me these probabilities of transition, I can tell you what the capacity is fairly easily. 
Like personally, I can code it up and it'll work. So let's think about um, just the, si the simplest channel you can imagine. It, it's called an erasure channel uh, and it has two inputs. Yeah, so it's a bit, it maps a bit. Uh, and with some probability, one minus P, zero goes to zero and one goes to one. So it sounds like a really great channel, but with some probability P, uh, there's an erasure. And that erasure is reflected at the output with a flag that just says, I'm sorry, your input was erased. So you can go off uh, uh, and calculate what's this capacity, the mutual information. It's, it's given by this one minus P. So what does that mean? It means if I have N uses of the channel, I can send N times one minus P bits. So that's actually quite astonishing because uh, typically if I have uh, many uses of the channel, a fraction P of them will be, uh, of the inputs will be erased. And I don't know which ones are gonna get erased from the beginning, uh, but uh, that means that only one minus P times N of the bits are gonna get through. Even though I didn't know which parts of those, uh, uh, which parts of the strings are gonna get erased, the error correcting code that achieves this one minus p capacity is a set of n bit strings that you can project down and look at those strings on basically any subset of size one minus p times n, and you can distinguish them all. No matter which, which subset you chose, uh, it basically works for all of them. Um, and that's kind of, well, the magic of, of classical information theory is that by choosing this code randomly, it does a great job being robust to the kinds of errors that happen. And you can see explicitly uh, that uh, this capacity sort of, well, it depends on P and it goes to zero exactly when the erasure probability is, is one. And, and for this particular channel, you know, we have good ways of achieving, uh, of achieving this capacity really in practice. And that's kind of the story of information theory maybe from 1950 to like 2000 was developing strategies to achieve these capacities that we know are uh, achievable but we only know are achievable in terms of some random coding strategy. So there's a lot more to information theory than just random coding, but um, it's, it's a good start to get to understand. And this is actually, this is the more, well, I really like this example because it shows just how good the error correcting codes are. Literally everything that's not erased is informative and you don't even have to know what gets erased in advance. You just can design a good way to, to deal with it. So that's our information theory introduction. Now let's look at uh, quantum information theory. So for a long time, people knew about the quantum effects. They knew about it even as information theory was being developed, um, but they thought of it in sort of the wrong way or the not sufficiently imaginative way. They thought of it as, well, quantum uh, measurements are necessarily, uh, are necessarily they disturb a state. So maybe these quantum effects are going to be uh, a limitation on, on uh, how well we can send uh, information like with very low, with very low uh, photon numbers or something. But actually what people discovered you know, starting in the eighties is quantum information. Actually, it, it's, if we add quantum effects to information theory, not only do we have new sources of noise, we have new possibilities and new opportunities for different strategies uh, that uh, we can uh, uh, implement. To, to do things that you couldn't even in principle do in a classical setting, like quantum key distribution. And it even gives you a better understanding of what does, what does secrecy even mean? What does secrecy um, actually mean? And, and um, how can we understand uh, classical information theory better by thinking of it uh, in terms of a, a, a special kind of quantum information theory? So in, the quantum, in quantum information theory, we have the same story, we have different capacities. There's a classical capacity for sending classical information. There's a private capacity for doing basically QKD. And then there's a quantum capacity. Uh, and I, I want to really focus on my favorite one of these, the quantum capacity. Um, but the, the stories I will tell have, have uh, similar, uh, there's a similar story about the other capacities. It's just that this one I think is the, the, the one that we understand, I don't want to say best, but the one where we see the richest theory at this point. So noisy quantum channel, well, what's a noiseless quantum channel? It's just a unitary evolution. This is the Schrodinger equation, yeah? And uh, uh, noisy quantum evolution, you can think of any noisy process as arising from some unitary interaction between the system you're trying to send and some inaccessible environment. So if you have optical fiber, the environment is like the degrees of freedom that absorb the light as your light goes through it. Um, and actually uh, uh, this way of thinking about uh, 
thinking about um, uh, thinking about uh, noise as uh, as being sort of derived from from entanglement with some inaccessible system uh, gives us a, a sort of a good habit of thinking about all mixed states, all density matrices as really being part of a pure whole. And we just don't have access to all of the degrees of freedom that would cause that to be pure. This way of thinking is sometimes called the church of the larger Hilbert space. Uh, if you'd like, I would be happy to tell you about why it implies that many worlds is kind of the natural and most conservative and correct interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, but we won't do it during this talk. Oh, it will help you understand this talk because you will understand quantum mechanics more clearly if you adopt many worlds. Okay, so uh, the quantum capacity of a quantum channel, it's defined just like the classical capacity, but now I'm trying to send a quantum state from a sender to a receiver, and they have access to some noisy communication link, a bunch of channels. And the quantum capacity is just defined as how many qubits can you send per channel use uh, without the, the qubits getting messed up too much, so with high fidelity. So we would like the second part of uh, of, of Shannon's result here, we would like a clean formula for this quantum capacity. And we, we don't quite get that, but we can get something, I guess, a bit similar uh, called the coherent information. This is uh, a quantity that measures uh, how much quantum correlation do we have between uh, the input of the channel and the receiver. And you measure it like this. You prepare some state that has two parts, A and R. And then you put the A part through the channel and the B part goes to the receiver, the E part goes to the environment. And this coherent information is just how much information do I have, how much information do I generate between R and the output minus the total amount of information that I generate between R and the environment. And there's this factor of a half for proper normalization. But the basic idea is if you wanna get quantum stuff through the channel, you have to make sure that the environment that you don't have any, any uh, control over doesn't learn anything about the messages that you're trying to send. And because of that, we have this like, how much more does Bob know than Eve knows? Um, and this quantity, the coherent information, um, it is kind of an analog of just the maximized mutual information um, in the sense that it characterizes the sort of the, the random coding rate that we can get over uh, a, a noisy quantum channel. So, if I choose a random code that basically looks like the input of this, this uh, looks like the A system of this pure state psi, then uh, I can choose it up to a rate of the coherent information and, it, and, it, and it's a good code. That means I can decode it with high, high fidelity. But, uh, uh, and if I choose it at a higher rate, uh, it's not gonna work well. So that's all good. Um, and you can show indeed that the quantum capacity is given by this, this regularized formula, this optimization over many uses of the channel. Um, um, but you know, there was this, this last additivity step that we wanted to see and didn't, well, we wanted to see in the classical case, and that's how we simplified everything. Um, we can in some cases simplify this formula, but generically, yeah, we have a characterization of this quantum capacity, but it's in terms of an optimization over an infinite number of variables. It's not a nice optimization. You know, even if you set this R equal to five, you're gonna have trouble if you literally try to go off and, op and, and do the optimization on your computer. Uh, so, and that's sort of that non-additivity of this Q1 that we're gonna see a little, in a little bit uh, is kind of the key challenge for us right now. How do we get around the fact that this Q1, this random coding rate is non-additive to, uh, to get a better understanding of what the quantum capacity is? And as I said, there's a similar story for private capacity, for classical capacity, and there's uh, similar non-additivities in those cases as well. So let's look at the quantum version first of this erasure channel. We already looked at it. The classical one, it just took zero to zero, or maybe an erasure, and one to one, or maybe an erasure. Uh, the quantum erasure channel is exactly the same thing. It takes a qubit in, and with some probability, one minus p, it, uh, erase, it, it sends the qubit state perfectly. And with some other probability P, there's an erasure. And there's a, this is, uh, it emits a flag onto some orthogonal space to the original qubit. So it maps a qubit to a qtrit. And you can express this now in terms of an isometry, uh, which is just a, you know, a fancy math way of saying a unitary. Uh, and uh, 
uh, this is a unitary representation of, uh, of what the action of the chain. Oh, there's a mathematician. I, I'm sure isometry is very deep and different from unitary. Um, and uh, the action, I shouldn't. Yeah, we should discuss this offline. I just wanted to tell you, you can find an amusing, uh, Quantum Magazine has an amusing story about some high energy physicists who learned about isometries recently and think they're very different from unitaries. It's quite amazing, actually. Um, anyway. Um, okay, so uh, anyway, we have this isometry and what does it do with some amplitude one minus P? It gives the state to Bob and the erasure flag to Eve and with some other amplitude uh, P or root P, it gives uh, the erasure to Bob and the, uh, the state to Eve. And you can evaluate this quantum, this quantum capacity actually. And it's given by this one minus two P. So very, very clean. Uh, it's different from the classical capacity. The classical capacity of this channel is actually uh, 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 one minus P still. So it's similar to the classical capacity of the classical erasure channel. But the quantum capacity goes down faster. And it, go, uh, it, uh, it does that because basically, uh, well, quantum information is much more delicate than classical. But it is, the interesting thing that happens here is right at a half, this is symmetric between B and E. And because it's symmetric, we'll see in a minute, the quantum capacity actually strictly has to go to zero. So that's different from what happens classically. If you can generate any correlation between the input and the output of a classical channel, if there's any wiggle at all at the output based on the input, uh, you can get some positive uh, classical capacity. But so the only, classical, the only channels with zero classical capacity are super boring. They put out some state and it doesn't depend on the input. Uh, quantumly, again, because it's, the information is more delicate, we, we find that there are non-trivial channels that can actually have some still some zero uh, quantum capacity, even though they allow some classical communication. So let's look at additivity. I told you additivity you should think of in this culinary fashion. Uh, additive quantities are like smoothies, non-additive. Quantities are not trivial, uh, and they're like uh, more like quantum, uh, more like baking bread or quantum capacities. And you know, I wouldn't say one is better or worse. Uh, smoothies are quick and easy. Uh, bread is is great, but uh, it can take time uh, and and skill. Uh, so first, let me say that we do know examples where this coherent information is additive. That's um, that tells us that you know, this random coding strategy is optimal in some settings. Uh, so specifically, uh, if, see if I have a, no. If, uh, if I have what's called a degradable channel, a channel where at the output, I can further process the output to get what the environment knows, then we can show that this Q1, the coherent information is additive. So when the output of the channel has, strictly more information than the environment. There's nothing that goes to the environment that the output can't understand. Then we get an additive coherent information. And therefore we can simplify this quantum capacity and get a nice formula. And even it's, an, even it's, a, it's a convex optimization problem. So, so it can be evaluated fairly easily. Um, that's a good lesson. So one of the lessons is, is, is that this coherent information is right for some channels. Random coding works well for some channels. And the second lesson is that this non-additivity of Q1, which I, I mentioned and we'll see a little more later, it, uh, it's really closely connected to what kind of information you're sen sending to the environment. Um, uh, unfortunately, or for, yeah, depending on whether you think it's a good or a bad thing to have non-additivity, uh, you might be either happy or disappointed that, uh, that most channels are not degradable. Most channels are not of this simple class that send strictly more information to the output than the environment. The erasure channel is an example of such a channel that is, and it, um, it, uh, that's the reason that I was able to write down the capacity and just draw it on a, on, a, on a plot for you rather than have to say, well, I don't know, there's some optimization problem, I don't know how to solve it. Um, there, for channels that are not degradable, what we find is sort of almost generically, uh, uh, you can get, uh, 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 get uh, non-additivity of this coherent information. So what does that mean? It means, well, you, you feed some state into the channel and you evaluate this difference of mutual information and you optimize over all input states and you get some value. But now uh, you 
what if you do that on two copies of the channel? So I, or N copies of the channel. If I take a bunch of copies of the channel and try to do that optimization problem, what we find sort of uh, often uh, is, uh, is that, uh, especially in, in sort of the regi regime with, with fairly high noise, uh, what we find is uh, that value, that optimization value, is strictly bigger than n times the single letter coherent information. And what that means is that, well, random codes uh, kind of don't do it for us. We need to add some extra structure that sort of that that does non something non trivial across the many channel uses in order to generate uh, in order to generate uh, the highest the highest rate that we can in order to generate the capacity of the quantum channel. And what we're seeing also with this, this uh, inequality is that there's some sort of non-trivial non, uh, uh, non interaction uh, of the channel with itself in order to, uh, in order to kind of boost its, its capacity. And just to, just to sort of recap, what we want to know is given a channel N, what kind of structure uh, do the best codes have for that channel? And ideally, we'd have some sort of recipe that says, hey, you give me the channel, here's how you you know, solve this optimization problem, and uh, I give you back the, uh, a description of the capacity achieving codes and what rates they achieve. Um, and, uh, you know, this non-additivity, uh, maybe, I guess, you know, uh, people have known about it for a while, but what's becoming more and more apparent is that, like, pick a, a kind of channel and, and go into the regime where it's kind of noisy, and chances are you're going to be able to find, uh, you're going to be able to find some kind of non-additivity uh, of this coherent information. So it's not like some curiosity, it's, it's kind of a fundamental feature of trying to communicate in the presence uh, of fairly high noise that you have to build these structured codes to achieve capacity. Okay. Uh, ah, oh. Okay, I don't want, there's a platypus coming. Um, Probably the simple, simplest example of a, of, a, of a channel where it's kind of easy to see that there's some non-additive, uh, non-additivity of, of this coherent information. Uh, what does it do? It takes zero and maps it to a maximally entangled state between the environment and uh, the output. So if I put in a zero, I'm going to get a maximally mixed state on zero one on the output. If I put in a one, I'm going to get a two out on the output. Uh, and that means you know, the receiver can, can perfectly distinguish whether I put in a zero or a one because they just measure, am I in the zero one subspace or am I in the, the, the two state? So, so this is kind of an example of, this is actually a degradable channel. It's very simple. I can, I can evaluate its quantum capacity, but I will now want to slightly um, complicate the, the simple channel. Whoop, whoop, yeah. uh, and add an extra input. So now it maps one three-level system to another three-level system. Uh, and, but what it does with the extra input is if I put in a one, you get a two at the output. If I put in a two, you also get a two at the output. So it's kind of like if you're trying to send information to the output, you probably don't really care that much about whether you send a one or a two. It's just about, uh, you know, the only thing that happens differently is that the environment uh, gets a different, a different signal rather than just the, uh, uh, just the receiver. The receiver gets the same signal. So this, this channel is not degradable anymore. It, it, um, it has a lot of really almost um, contradictory features, much like the platypus. Um, I don't know, platypus is, uh, there are many things about the platypus. Um, it is a mammal, yeah, that lays eggs, that has a beak. And furthermore, what's the other one? It has poisonous spines. There are other things too you can look up on, on the internet. And uh, it was originally thought to be some sort of, uh, some sort of scam, right? Like when Europeans, or when, uh, when the English sent out their people to find out like what the rest of the world is like, somebody came back with a platypus and they're like, this is made up. This is, uh, you took a beaver and you put some duck stuff on it. Um, but actually it's a real thing. And it, it has these, these features that are very, 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 very contradictory. So first of all, it has a very simple classical capacity and a very simple private capacity. And furthermore, both the channel and its complement, so the, the channel, the, the, the map that goes from the input to the environment, both of them have very simple, uh, very simple uh, capacities, but somehow 
uh, it still manages to, to isolate and generate this non-additivity of coherent information, the suboptimality of random coding strategies um, for fairly, fairly high, uh, fairly low noise rate, rates. And even, even better, it's kind of, uh, it's the optimizing state that you use for the, uh, to, uh, to achieve that. So this, this sort of structured codes that you're gonna use to achieve that, that non-additive uh, uh, coherent information are kind of different and, and unusual from the, from the normal ones. So I think, I mean, personally, I think this is a, I mean, we don't understand this perfectly. We have some understanding of how, how to do quantum coding for it, but it clearly isolates uh, how the coding and, and me messages that you send to the environment are kind of key in, uh, in order to understanding this non-additivity. So I think this is something, well, this is something that we should uh, continue to look at and try to, uh, to use as a, as a tool to generate uh, better uh, sort of principles for designing good quantum error correcting codes. Okay, so, so let me just uh, sort of summarize what, we're, what I'm, I've said about non-additivity. Um, so quantum inter resources, they do interact non-trivially and, and the goal of generating these clean examples like the platypus um, is to help us work towards some general coding strategy. Um, and uh, specifically the hint that we're getting from this platypus is, is really a more environmental focused approach should be one that uh, where we could make progress. And the, the whole point of trying to understand these capacities is to find a good recipes for finding uh, quantum error correcting codes that allow us to, to uh, communicate at rates beyond the coherent information. Okay, now in my remaining 10 minutes, I will uh, tell you a little bit about um, zero quantum capacity channels. This is, what's the, Anything you want to share with uh, everybody? Somebody's laughing. No, sorry. Okay, so here's an example of a zero quantum capacity channel. I made it and uh, uh, Paul was telling me that I'm on track to becoming a good experimentalist uh, because of the tour I did earlier today, but he hadn't seen this. But actually I, I have pliers, yeah. And I have screwdrivers. One, a student I was teaching, she said, huh? It's some kind of tin snips or something, right? I don't know. Uh, okay, never mind. Anyway, the thing, I had a, a, one of my students said, you know, Graham, you wouldn't believe how much of, doing really high-end experiments is plumbing. And, and, and I, don't, I don't know, we had just, we have had floods in our building and it's very annoying. I, I, I don't, did, okay. I, uh, well, I'll tell you lunch maybe. It was very funny. Somebody sends around an email. Does anybody know how to get about 400, 400 liters of water out of an optical table? Experimentalists. <laughs> We just go, we just work from home when, when, when it floods. Anyway, uh, so here's a zero capacity classical channel. I told you it doesn't have any correlation between input and output. However, uh, it's kind of the only zero capacity, zero capacity classical channel. The quantum capacity uh, goes to zero faster than the classical capacity. So there are examples like the 50% erasure channel that has uh, zero quantum capacity, but generates non-zero, uh, non-trivial correlations between the input and the output. And in fact, you can find, oops, you can find examples of channels that kind of have uh, zero quantum capacity for one of them, zero quantum capacity for the other. But if you put the two things together, there's some positive quantum capacity. That's kind of like a really strong kind of non-additivity where you've got an interaction between extremely different uh, quantum resources. And again, part of what we're interested in when we do this is what are the quantum resources? Because clearly a 50% erasure channel together with something is, useful to generate some, some value. But the question is, what, how should I characterize that something that I get to put together with this quantum capacity, this 50% erasure channel, this symmetric channel, symmetric between B and E? And what is it that this symmetric channel has? It's definitely not quantum capacity, but it's some, it has some kind of value that we're trying to understand. So we're still really groping around to qualitatively understand the theory and, and you know, identify what are the sort of fundamental, most, uh, most um, 
most distinct resources and how do they interact with each other? I can tell you, you know, about this 50% erasure channel. We're going to show that it has zero clonal capacity. Um, and it's very simple. It's based on no cloning. Basically, what's no cloning? It says there's no map that takes an unknown quantum state psi and maps it to two copies of psi. Uh, for uh, the mathematicians, you see quantum mechanics is linear, but this is not linear. So you can't do it. Huh? And actually, there's like a slight decoration or slight improvement of the idea, which is that, hey, if you want to maintain linearity, uh, if you leak a little bit of information about what state it is to one party, it's going to collect the information that you had about the state that's sent to the other party. So if you want to send information perfectly from one person to another, you have to keep it totally uh, private from the, from the second party. And no cloning, I, I, no cloning to me, I think it's, it's really at the heart of how classical and quantum information differ. I, his, I hesitate because Chris Fuchs was just visiting us and he, he really took exception to this this uh, this uh, this claim, but uh, also we we debated interpretations of quantum mechanics. You can find it on YouTube. And the main thing they did one of these polls before and after who believes cubism versus many worlds, and and then what they found is both of us lost. Uh, we we lo we lost um, we lost uh, boosters. Yeah, people. I, I convinced forty people by explaining. Uh, many worlds, how I understand it, that many worlds is not the way to go. But perhaps at lunch, I can convince you that many worlds is uh, the most natural and conservative and useful interpretation of quantum mechanics. Okay, so, well, let's say we have a symmetric channel now. What does symmetric mean? It means if I swap the environment and the output, uh, it's going to be equal to uh, the same thing as if I didn't do the swap. So it's totally symmetric information between B and E. If you remember this formula with the difference of mutual informations, now you can kind of mathematically understand that that difference of mutual informations is always going to be zero because uh, they're the same state. And an example you could have in mind is maybe a 50% attenuation channel. But let's do this in terms of no cloning. Suppose this thing had some quantum capacity. Then, uh, well, I get to use many copies of it. And I can do an encoding and a decoding. And there's a way to send at least a qubit from here to there. So if there's some capacity, I can send a qubit over the channel. However, this thing is symmetric in B and E. So if any decoder that works on the Bs also works on the Es and gives me another copy of the channel or of the state. So boom, no quantum capacity. Uh, and actually all known examples of zero quantum capacity so far, uh, they have kind of like a reason like this for having zero quantum capacity. Um, and, you know, that's the sort of the first class of things that add up together. The PPT thing, the, the reason a PPT state has no quantum capacity is that instead of no cloning, the transpose operation is a non-physical operation that maps density matrices to density matrices. Okay, so you can find these examples and, the, the, you know, it's very fun. You have these different resources. We're still trying to understand what the two kinds of different resources are. Um, I want to give you an idea for better understanding quantum capacity itself by slightly changing the problem we tried to solve, but changing it in a way that simplifies the solution. The idea is that these symmetric channels where, where I can swap B and D, uh, they have zero quantum capacity. We saw that I can combine them with a, uh, another kind of channel to that has zero quantum capacity to generate some positive quantum capacity. Uh, so they can be useful in that sense, right? They can take this a priori useless thing and turn it into something useful. So somehow you can get an interaction between the symmetric channels and other channels. But the idea is maybe that interaction isn't too strong, or maybe that interaction is something at least I can characterize how good, how good the performance is when I get that interaction. Okay. Uh, let's say then what I want to do is if you have a channel N, I'm going to give you arbitrary symmetric channel. Yeah, it has zero quantum capacity. I'm going to say you're allowed to use that in order to code for this channel N. Um, what is the quantum capacity uh, of, that, uh, of that channel when assisted by this additional resource? Uh, you can characterize that quantum capacity. It's always bigger than the 
standard quantum capacity because you don't have to use this additional resource. And uh, sorry, it's all it's never smaller, right? Uh, and sometimes you can have a zero quantum capacity channel that has some positive QSS. SS is for symmetric side channel. Um, and those are the cases where you have this non-additivity of, of uh, a quantum capacity for two zero capacity channels. Now, the nice thing that happens when I add this additional resource is I can get a much cleaner uh, expression for the quantum capacity uh, uh, with symmetric side channels for QSS. It's given by this optimization. This is just the, the, this difference of mutual information is written in a slightly different way between uh, some uh, reference state R and the output of the channel. But there's this extra, this extra system hanging around. I do an optimization now over uh, input states phi RA, which is the standard optimization I would do for just the coherent information. But I add these extra, these extra systems F and G. And I insist that this state is symmetric in F and G. And basically, F and G are like the outputs of the symmetric channel I gave you for free. Two minutes? Perfect. Huh? Plus X. Um, No, okay, okay, but okay, so here's the beautiful thing. This quantity I can show is additive. So that means I get a nice clean expression for this capacity uh, by adding this extra symmetric channel. And uh, I get, you know, I told you additivity means you don't get non-trivial interactions and it simplifies your life. And actually this is additive and I find that beautiful, but it doesn't simplify your life yet because there's no a priori bound on the dimension of these, these F and G systems. So we still don't have a good way to calculate this. However, stay tuned that we have some ideas for, for relaxing this to some, some, uh, some optimization problem we can actually solve. Um, uh, but generically, you know, understanding optimizations over unbounded dimensions is a super hard thing to do. And, uh, and we don't know, uh, well, we need to learn how to do that in order to, in order to understand quantum Shannon theory. All the tools we have for doing that, and there are tools for doing that in classical information theory, they don't work for these kinds of problems. Okay, so let's just summarize here. Uh, additivity and non-additivity were a key theme that I talked to you about. Um, it tells us, additivity tells us we're on the right track with random coding. Non-additivity tells us, you know, we're missing some key ideas about generating good codes and structured codes. And, uh, or complicated, complicated examples of uh, non-additivity kind of obscure what is happening and making big, more and more simple examples of non-additivity with a more explicit role for the environment, uh, I believe is a, is a path forward to, uh, uh, towards uh, understanding the capacity questions better. And I focused on the coherent information uh, and quantum capacity, but there are similar stories uh, for classical capacity, for private capacity, and for other more exotic sorts of capacities. Uh, and uh, with that, I would like to thank you and uh, offer to, uh, to have lunch with you uh, uh, if it has been provided. Thanks a lot, Graham, for this very nice talk. Uh, questions for Graham? I would suppose. That's for where I do Zoom. This is better. So, has the non additivity of the platitus Q1 be experimentally verified? You could do that, right? I mean, because it's uh, three, three, nine qubits. It's not with itself. It's, it's with, not, it's it's with, with that or it's with the qubit. Yeah, it's with the qubit so, ratio. But this could be experimentally verified maybe, right? Yes, I think so. Has it been? No. Oh, and my second question is what is QSS for the platitus? want to, right? Because we think it's out of it. I don't relate that, and it's definitely different. Not definitely. It must be different from, uh, from the quantum capacity because of the non-additivity. Um, but I, I can't say I put any effort into doing that optimization, partially because of these darn uh, high dimensions, I never know how far I have to push it. 
uh, to do the optimization. Since so you described the non-additivity as a generic feature of quantum channels. I wonder if you could phrase that a bit more quantitatively, or do we know of sufficient conditions for which you have non-additivity, or is it just folklore? It's an emotional statement, okay, and maybe even a faith-based statement. Uh, I believe in non-additivity, and it believes in me. Uh, no, but I, I, sorry, I didn't mean to, well, I did, but... Um, what I wanted to say is, what I mean is, like, uh, if you take the platypus channel with essentially any, any uh, channel with kind of coherent information that's fairly small, you, you know, just numerically you see it. And also if you take, like, anything that's different, like, that's far from degradable and you push on it enough, you tend to see it. I believe Nick Zeng did it, or a student of hers at University of Bonn. I think found like, well, you know about these things. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that like that will, with high probability, just have no capacity at all. Like you, you, you would have to, you would have to condition on the channel itself being uh, not useless, like have positive capacity, but then non-additivity is the norm rather than the exception that, that we're fairly confident, I think about. But that's not like, that's not a quantitative statement for you yet. It's but oh, very good. How does it? Okay, I think I very, a very uncomfortable. Fine. Uh, okay. Uh, I can go till noon, right? I can give two minutes on this. Okay. Here's the idea. Yeah. So the problem is you will have some AC magnetic field and you want to find out what's the strength of the AC magnetic field. Um, uh, okay. So you can do a Ramsey interferometry and uh, let's look at this picture. Right. Uh, okay. And um, well, you prepare a plus state, you let it evolve, and you just measure in plus minus. And that does really good down here for zero, near zero frequency, but it kind of doesn't do so well for higher frequencies. So uh, you can do something else. If you have some particular frequency you want to hit, you can just hit it with pi pulses every once in a while, just as the sign of the, uh, just as the things start to go turning back around, you hit it with pi pulse and it keeps accumulating phase. So you can, you can kind of get a peak over here if you want. Um, and we measure what, well, you know, how, how good or how sensitive are we to uh, this magnetic field strength? And you can do it in terms of Fisher information. And then you can plot the Fisher information as a function of frequency. And what you get is like a, you know, the, uh, and also as a function, you know, if you have, if you do a, a time t, or if you, if you let it evolve for time t, you get a peak of about t squared and the width of about one over t. Uh, and then what you can show is, that, here are my thoughts on it. What you can show is that if I integrate this whole thing, yeah, uh, if I restrict my attention to certain families of protocols, uh, the area under the sensitivity curve can't be any bigger than like T. Uh, but uh, that's not a generic, uh, a generic uh, uh, relation. I mean, if you restrict to pi pulses, it is true. But by driving, uh, by driving this thing, you can actually, by driving this thing, it's sort of, uh, constant, uh, sorry, uh, by applying a constant magnetic field uh, with uh, an associated frequency of, that's roughly equal to the, the frequency you want sensitivity at, you can get uh, more like T squared uh, area under the curve. So you can broaden that curve and have sensitivity across many, many, uh, a wide range of frequencies uh, be do better than if you were just trying to isolate the frequency by doing pi pulses. And here's what the evolutions look like. And you can show you can't do any better than an integrated Fisher information of T squared. Uh, so uh, I like the idea that there's, you know, these bounds tell us that there's sort of, there's no free quantum Fisher information. You, if you want sensitivity in one uh, range of frequency space, you have to give up sensitivity in another range. You just have to kind of uh, pick where you want to be sensitive. And this also has some, some potential applications, these, these kinds of bounds 
to uh, the effectiveness of dynamical decoupling. Basically, you have, you have a sensitivity budget in dynamical decoupling that you're gonna have to spend somewhere. And the whole goal is to put your sensitivity away from, from where the noise is. Those, those are the thoughts. That answer, <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Maybe a final question? Uh, well, what you do in spin echoing is, well, you, you sort of hit with pi pulses, right? And that isolates you from some DC field. And the question that we're trying to look at here is um, what is the profile of sensitivities that uh, sort of a generic protocol has um, at different sets of frequencies? So it really is like looking at, well, if you do spin echo, um, you isolate yourself from DC fields, but actually you, you, uh, you're gonna have sensitivity for, for higher frequencies. And it's a question about how, if I try to get rid of the, the sensitivity, you know, how, how much do I actually get stuck with in the end, um, in, sort of inevitably? Yeah, maybe a final question. Did you win the Chilla Bake Off? No, I did not. Not enough cranberries? Or too many. You know. Anyway, my colleague, they they had. I think I would have if if one of my colleagues had not been sick, because he was supposed to be Eric Cornell was supposed to be uh, Paul Hollywood, and dressed up, but he was sick. No, 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 no. He was sick from before, and was therefore unable to eat the thing. I made. But I will have you know I won the Jilla Cup, as you will. Oh, it's the it's our athletic uh, it's our athletic trophy. <laughs>